with, originally it was 36 holes, it's now up to 60. Mm -hmm. The holes are different things that are known to cause dementia or contribute to the disease process. And so getting people to plug 60 holes is pretty impossible and it's usually not necessary because most of us don't have all 60. So what I wanted was to come up with this healthy dozen, the big ticket items that are good for just about everybody. And I think if you start them early and you just do most of these items, you're gonna greatly reduce your risk of getting Alzheimer's and other neurodegenerative diseases. So that handout is, is there for you. I think you have it. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to call this the age of the brain. Uh, I remember being in medical school 35 years ago, and I was always a brain fan. I was always fascinated with it. And I remember telling a roommate of mine that this is the new frontier. This is where the discoveries are going to be made. And it was an exciting time. And he was getting his PhD at the time in immunology. And rather than spend a few exciting minutes talking about what I wanted to talk about, <laughs> he said, no, it's the immune system. And if you look at the last 35 years in medicine, you would have to agree he was right and I was wrong. We have had an amazing uh, explosion of effective drugs based on the immune system. So I'm here to tell you today, now, it's the dawn of the age of the brain. I only missed it by a little more than half my career. <laughs> But the, the, if you, the other reason I like the, the name, the title, Age of the Brain, it's, it's helpful to understand how old the brain really is. And 35 years in the lifespan of the human brain, that's not a miss, that's, that's a bullseye. We are all very, very fortunate right now to be living in a time where the human brain, after so long, is finally figuring itself out because we can benefit from that. So this is, you know, a helpful timeline. Um, over here, about six million, six seven million years ago, you see Homo and Pan. Well, Homo, that's our genus, Homo sapiens. Pan is chimps, and there, there was. There was a common ancestor to chimps and humans back then, and at some point around that time, the lines diverged. And what I find really helpful about that and, and relevant to what we're talking about today is that 99% of our genes are the same as chimps. I actually used to think it was 96, and I just read an article in Nature from a few years ago 99% of our genes are the same. So yeah, there can be a lot of difference in that 1%, that's good. But my point is, in six million years, we've changed genetically less than 1%. And if you think about it, the things that are more likely to change from random mutation and from being subject to different selective pressures and different conditions, the things that are likely to change are gonna be the not so essential things, you know, height, skin color, bone structure, that kind of thing. But what really is going to be heavily conserved are the things that are essential to life, the metabolism, what we eat, how we, how we reproduce, and how our brains function, because our brains have been a very high priority throughout our evolution. So if you look at where we started, you go all the way over to today, just left of today, 250,000 years ago, that's where Homo sapiens came on the scene. That's not that long compared to where we started six billion years ago, but I don't think anybody can really, I don't think humans can imagine 250,000 years. It's just a, a, an incredibly long time. <clears throat> but we can't you'd have to expect that if we change genes about 1% in six million years, not a lot of those probably came in the last 250,000. So I wanna focus on this because agriculture started about 10,000 years ago. And I wanna use this timeline and I want us to lean on 
our evolutionary history and biology and how conditions were back then. Because I think it can be helpful for us figuring out what's true and what's not true about things like how to take care of the brain. So what happens with agriculture? You get grains that used to be seeds that you'd find and you might eat them. And you, you figure out how to use those grains and plant them for a, a stable, reproducible source of food. And it's grain food. It's, a lot of it is carbs. And we didn't have that before. Well, that was a good thing. You know, it's, it's good to have calories. It's good to not starve. So that's not a bad thing. But what would that do to our genetics? What happens when we eat grains? And you can look at science today, nutritionists today will tell you, well, when you eat grains, you're going to get a surge of blood sugar. Grains, carbs, they give you a spike in blood sugar when you eat them. And the, the body responds to a spike in blood sugar with a spike in insulin to drive that sugar into cells where it becomes stored for, as fat. And so when we look at modern nutrition and we think, okay, if I eat carbs, if I have uh, cereal or pancakes for breakfast, I'm gonna have a spike of sugar, spike of insulin, that will drive my sugar levels down in my blood and I'm gonna get hungry. And I'm gonna wanna eat again before too long. And that's what we know happens in carbs. And you think, well, what sense does that make to design a metabolism that does that? But if you look at our evolutionary history, you realize, well, that's a new add-on. That's kind of like giving, putting a diesel fuel into your gasoline engine. Before that, anytime we encountered quick sugar carbs in our environment, for 99 point whatever percent of our genome, we encountered that sugar and we wanted to get our insulin spike, we wanted to drive that sugar into our cells so we could store it as fat. And then we wanted to be hungry again later because if that berry bush was ripe or if that field of vegetables was, was ripe, we wanted to strike while the iron was hot and, and store as many of those calories as we could because then we might survive the next drought or the night, next famine. See, we're designed to have carbs turn our bodies into these fat-forming machines. And what else does insulin do? It prevents us from burning fat. So when you've got insulin going up and down, you can't burn your own fat. You're going to want more carbs. So I focus on this because it really does make sense. If you know how we evolved, it makes sense as an example of what you should eat today. We also, we also know some other, oh, sorry, one in the back. We also know some other things about other ways we can use this timeline and this knowledge of our, our evolution. Um, what else do we know? You know, Michelle was talking about some of those things. We didn't have sunblock, we didn't wear as many clothes, we didn't have shoes. So we, we encountered a lot more sun, we got vitamin D, we got probiotics without taking them in, out of a jar. We, we did a lot of things that are normal and our bodies were normal then for millions of years. Our bodies adapted to it. That's how our machines were designed to run. And I wanna, I said I wanted you guys to listen critically. I wanted, I, my goal here is not just to throw out information. My goal here is almost like an attorney. I'm trying to make a case. I'm trying to persuade the jury that we're right. And sometimes, it might, you might ask, well, why is that so important? Why do you act like you always gotta prove yourself? <laughs> because if you go out there and talk to your doctor or your neurologist, or you go to online authorities and experts, they will disbelieve what we're telling you. It's a good question, why you would believe an orthodontist, two retired docs, a family <laughs> practice doc in Green Bay. But that's what we're asking you to do, so figure it out. <laughs> so these are neurodegenerative diseases, right? You've seen them before. On the left side, we have the, the dementias. You know, Alzheimer's is the most common. And then on the right side, we've got other neurodegenerative dis diseases. Probably in many of these cases, 
the same underlying pathology is happening, whether it's a combination of inflammation and a nutrient problem and a hormone imbalance, but it's just in a circulatory issue or whatever the reason may be, but on the, it depends where in the brain or what part of the brain is most severely affected, that's how it manifests as a distinct disease. So what is conventional medicine? What do the experts tell us about NDD, neurodegenerative diseases? I used Harrison's textbook of medicine back in the 80s. This is from a 1991 version. Degenerative di diseases are gradually evolving, relentlessly progressive neuronal death for reasons still largely unknown. That's the same thing Harrison said 35 years ago. Let's get up to date. And uptodate.com, which is a very good online medical or health resource for you. This deals just with Alzheimer's, but it says basically the same thing. The drugs that have developed been developed to cure Alzheimer's, none of them cure the disease. Most people who take them are disappointed with the results. And over the time, over time, the patient will continue to worsen. They don't say most patients probably will worsen. This is the conventional expert view, and that was last month. And we're here to tell you that they're wrong, and we want you to believe us. So for us to do that, oh, I, I put this, I got this yesterday. I did a screenshot yesterday. This is from WebMD. People use WebMD and check things out there. I put in, you know how if you autofill, if you start typing something and it will autofill what you're, you know. I got all the way to Alzheimer's disease TR before it said, well, okay, treatment. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's like, it, treatment, who, who searches treatment? It's like they don't even think treatment is an option. But anyway, you see what, there what it says. Um, it talks about some of the meds. They can temporarily alter the, the cognitive performance but the underlying disease, not affected. Eventually, it gets worse. Well, why, one, you, you, why should you believe us? Let's first start with why do the authorities and experts disbelieve us? I've spent a lot of time thinking about that. And you know, one of the kind of easy answers, doctors are arrogant. Well, I don't like that answer. <laughs> you know, it's just a little simplistic. And even if doctors are arrogant, they would still want to know how to help their patients. Well, maybe what this really means, doctors think they know it all already. There may be a little bit more truth in that, but I think the best way, I, I was preparing a talk a couple years ago, and I was worried about how physician colleagues might view me saying something so heretical as uh, these incurable diseases might be cured. And um, I came across this quote. This is a historian who was writing about the Copernican revolution. You know, Copernicus is the guy that said, we got the sun and earth orbiting thing backward. And he met up with a lot of resistance at that time. And this quote really is important. And it says a lot, not just about why authorities might disagree with us, but it also reveals some things about how the brain works. New ideas meet their greatest resistance from solid knowledge. If you're ignorant, you'd, you probably know you're ignorant or you'd be eager to know. But if you believe you know the answer, it closes your mind a little bit. And that's just how the brain works too. The, if you go to a neurologist who has established her career being an expert on dementia, and you ask about dementia, she has a lot of cognitive brain structure, a lot of work and a, and a lot of energy, and, and it, it all fits. It's very solid. And that's very good because you don't want her gullible. You don't want her to miss important things. But it does tend to make your thinking less flexible. <coughs> You're a little less open-minded that way. And, uh, I notice when I talk to physician colleagues, the further they are from dementia and neurology and their specialists, specialties, the more open-minded they are about this, without exception. 
if you talk to an orthopedic surgeon, who I think some would agree are barely even doctors, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, Ralph. I forgot. <laughs> you talk to, let's say, a general surgeon. <laughs> to a general surgeon, and they're right away thinking, oh, this is very, yeah, well, why wouldn't it be? But you t the closer you get, internist, neurologist, and then someone specializing in dementia, the more their, their minds are narrowed. So I think that's a big part of why you're gonna meet with some resistance. And then there's another part of that too, it's socially. You know, we all have brains, so you can almost kind of say, well, there's a, there's a group psychology to this. If you, have established a lot of expert knowledge in your brain, and you've established yourself as an expert, others around you know that too, and they recognize your credentials. And if you're looking for an opinion, you wanna to go to that person who's an expert. And it even trickles into the science. If you're the director of funding, let's say, for NIH, and you have X million dollars that you're gonna allocate for this or that or the other competing studies, why would you go out on a limb and fund something that might be controversial, and it doesn't really make sense to your understanding anyway. So this sort of bias creeps into the very science that doctors depend upon in their journals and discussions with colleagues. So I think that's a good reason, but my favorite is, oh, I forgot about this one. A general surgeon told me this. It's not a pill, it's not easy. You know, there's a reason the cure rate for obesity is less than that of cancer, and it always has been. I mean, it's, if, if you could cure, if you could cure, we know how to cure obesity, it's just not easy. So here's my favorite, and this is my favorite, and I apologize if nobody else in the room is even remotely interested, but this fascinates me. I think brain science is revealing the limits of what we call, or what we know of as conventional medical science. I think that's what's going on, and I think, to, to show you what I mean, well, it's, it does this in two ways. One way is, we touched on earlier, there are multiple, multiple causes, 60 possible holes in the room. It's hard to design a placebo-controlled, double-blind experiment for 60 individual variables for a disease that takes decades sometimes to emerge. That's impossible, you can't do that. And so, medical science is great because if it's something like scurvy or let's say cardiovascular disease, atherosclerosis, you can isolate smoking or you can isolate obesity or high blood pressure and you can follow populations along and you can learn there's definitely a benefit a, a, a factor, there's a role. You can quantify it. This has been the foundation of medical science. You know, it's proof, we, it's, it gives us certainty. You can't get certainty about 20 different things that contribute to Alzheimer's. Not like that, not the same way. So that's one way that we're reaching the limit because it has so many potential contributing causes. The other way, I'm gonna ask you to kind of imagine something with me. Let's go back to about 400 BC, and we're gonna hang out with Hippocrates. Hippocrates had a bunch of students, and they collaborated, and they learned about medicine. This is about as early medicine as we have good information on. And how did they do it? They tried things out, they communicated, they kept records, of what happened when they tried things, and they tried it again. And I want you to imagine Hippocrates and a couple dozen of his students, his colleagues, standing in a pool, a shallow pool, the size of this room. Every one of us is an early physician studying with Hippocrates, and everyone in this room can see the far edges of that pool. You can look all around you, you can see the cutting edge of medical knowledge. That pool is known medical knowledge. And that pool is not so big that it can't fit into every head in this room. And you can see where, where, the, where the shoreline is trickling and advancing, where the, someone makes a discovery and that the known knowledge is expanding. You can see it. 
Well, what happens 1500, 1600, 1800 when you've got the scientific revolution and we have a lot more cumulative experience that we've been sharing and we get certainty with experiment? By then you're in, what, Lake Winnebago? <laughs> Certainly by the early 1900s, if I'm a primary care physician standing out in the middle of Lake Winnebago, there's gonna be part of that shoreline I cannot see from here. I can't know that body of knowledge, but I have a colleague who can. I can look way over at that far corner and I can see a cardiologist that I know, and he can, he can see the shoreline from there and he can tell me what this, whether this new development has, has merit or not. So what evolved as we got more medical knowledge, we got specialization and we got journals and we got conventions and, and conferences. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> uh, maybe we'll, maybe, maybe. Jim says the AMA is piped into our room and they turn it down. <laughs> I thought Michelle was the long way <laughs> So um, <laughs> now go now go fast forward like to uh, current times, and we have the internet, and we have we have like this global brain instantly connected. So we have the ability to master all this information, and yet the body of knowledge. It'd be like, well, here this is why I needed that. It'd be like the Great Lakes system, Superior, Erie, Michigan, all of them. So right now we have a wonderful system that evolved and was very proficient at communicating cutting edge information all the way up through the better half of the 20th century. And now it's just too much. I'm in the middle of Lake Superior someplace and I can't see anybody who can see the shore. I don't know if I can see anybody who can see anybody who can see the shore. But the shore is still out there growing because what have we not lost in all this time? Trial, air, share. Try, air, share. Observe, communicate. What was it? You were in a group that was 1,000 and now it's 70? 1,000 in January, 72,000 now. That is a fast growing shoreline. And you know what, the, you know what it lacks? Proof. There's no certainty. I spent I spent better part of a day, Jim, in my office trying to find clinical studies on TRS, and I found a, an article. What, there's an article from Croatia which is about safety, but there's no there's no medical science done on this. There is uh, there is on clinoptilolite zeolites. It's TRS. That I didn't interrupt that. your talk. <laughs> How many people are glad I interrupted? <laughs> so the point is, all right, this is a great example. After, let me get this right. After 26 years of marriage, I figured out how to make this make me right. <laughs> this makes the point that um, research can be done but a doctor might not know about it. And neurologists won't know about it, experts won't know about it, and that's what's happening. So, um, I haven't even looked at the clock. Okay, so I should, I should be about done. So, um, I want you folks to think and decide, lean on understanding of the, of the evolution and whatever else you know, but be open-minded. And a couple other things I do wanna say. Doctors and patients need each other. This isn't easy for doctors either because patients are asking them questions about that shoreline that they didn't know existed. And, it's, and they don't know how to get that information. It's not, it, it, it's, it's not how they were trained to serve you. So your patients, be patient as you bring us doctors along. Work with them. And the final thing I'll say is this. Thanks to our miraculous brain, we humans know 
that suffering and death await us, that may be unique to us. And so we know when the time draws near, illness uh, with our, ourselves or our loved ones, we know that there's a time to accept the limits. If you've run your race and you've run out of options, that's the time for resignation. And you want to be able to accept your fate with grace, and if necessary, lose your life, but not your dignity. The problem is, there are a lot of people with neurodegenerative diseases right now. Alzheimer's, memory problems, Parkinson's, MS. And conventional medicine is telling them there is no hope. We have nothing else. And my strongest message is, this is not the time for resignation. This is the time for learning, this is the time for hope, and this is the time for action. Thank you for your attention.